Welcome back everyone. We are now moving on to section 10.2, Properties of Liquids. We're going to distinguish between adhesive and cohesive forces, define viscosity, surface tension, and capillary rise, and describe the roles of intermolecular attractive forces in each of these properties and phenomena. So we're going to start with viscosity. The viscosity of a liquid is a measure of its resistance to flow. So it's measured by the rate at which a metal ball falls through a liquid. If you have a higher viscosity or thicker liquid, it's going to fall slower because the liquid is going to resist it more. The viscosity is determined by intermolecular forces, size of the molecule, the shape of it, and temperature. So if you have something at a higher temperature, you're going to have a lower viscosity because the molecules are moving more rapidly and overcoming those intermolecular forces. And when you have intermolecular forces between identical molecules, you have cohesive forces. So cohesive together. Over on the right is a table with some viscosities of common substances at 25 degrees Celsius. So water, for instance, has a viscosity of 0 0.890 millipascal seconds. And then you look at something like honey with a very high viscosity upwards can get up to 10,000 millipascal seconds. Okay, so honey is very viscous, right? If you go to try to pour it out of something, it doesn't pour very easily. Like I actually have this plunger type measuring cup that lets you push it into uh, a bowl or whatever it is that you need it in. And then you get most of it out instead of trying to struggle with a measuring cup. Um, motor oil is something else that has a fairly high viscosity. It flows fairly slowly. So when you have a molecule that's in the middle of a liquid, okay, so it's in there, it's surrounded by all these other molecules that are the same as it, assuming it's just one liquid. And so it's attracted equally in all directions by cohesive forces. But if it's on the surface of the liquid, it's only getting attracted by about half as many molecules because not all of it is inside. You have half of it that's on the surface, meaning it's exposed to air. So what happens is the liquids are going to contract to make a shape that minimizes the number of molecules on the surface. So this is why drops of liquids tend to form spherical shapes. And then we have surface tension. Now surface tension is the energy required to increase the surface area of a liquid or the force required to increase the length of a liquid surface by a given amount. So this is a result of the cohesive forces that are in a liquid and makes the surface of a liquid like a stre stretched rubber membrane. So back in my grad school research days, um, I didn't really work with it, but I had other uh, lab mates who did. We had an instrument called a tensiometer and that was used for measuring the surface tension of liquids. So you would literally put in your liquid and it would form a droplet that you would take a picture of and then you would kind of tell it where the curves are and stuff and then it would use that, it would map into, it would use it as a map and then give you the surface tension of the droplet. So there's some examples of surface tensions of some common substances at 25 degrees Celsius, room temperature. Water has a surface tension around 71.99 millinewtons per meter. Compare that to something like mercury, and mercury has a much higher surface tension of 258.48 millinewtons per meter. But you can also see water actually has a higher surface tension than ethylene glycol, which ethylene glycol is 47.99. And if you recall, ethylene glycol's viscosity is actually a lot higher than water, 16.1. So they don't necessarily track perfectly together. Um, and then here's just kind of zooming in on the attractive forces for a spherical water droplet. So for if you have that water molecule that's in the center, you see it's just all these different directions that it's exposed to other molecules. Whereas the one on the surface only has it for about half of it because the other half is exposed to air. Surface tension is also why things like water strider bugs, ew, I hate bugs, are able to hang out on the surface of water. 
You can also see this if you take like a paper clip and very gently put it on a water surface, it'll float. But if you were to look closely, you would actually see little kind of indents in the water. And you can see that on the surface strider here, these little indents. But yeah, it's the surface tension holding it up. So those were cohesive forces. Now, if you have intermolecular forces between two different molecules, we have adhesive forces. So for example, if you take water and put it on a wax surface, it doesn't get, the wax doesn't get wet. Instead, you get these drops of water because the cohesive forces in the water drops are greater than the adhesive forces between the water and the wax. Now, if you take that water and put it on glass, it spreads out because the adhesive forces between the water and glass are stronger than the water's cohesive forces. This is also what causes the concave meniscus in a glass tube. So if you take a test tube and you put water in it, it forms a meniscus. Okay, so water is wetting the glass and it's creeping up the side of the tube. So that's what's happening and why you have this concave meniscus. Mercury makes a convex meniscus. So if you've somehow had a test tube of mercury, it would actually look like this. And this is due to cohesive forces overcoming the adhesive forces with the water. And so the co cohesive forces make it become a drop, droplet type shape. And here's an actual picture of, a, um, of the two. Now another thing to talk about is capillary action. So liquid can flow within a porous material due to the attraction of the liquid molecules to the surface of that material and to other liquid molecules. So the adhesive forces and cohesive forces are working together to make the liquid move upwards against gravity. For instance, thin layer chromatography. Um, an example of this is if you were, a lot of us when we were in elementary school, they gave you strips of like a coffee filter and they had you like take, um, put a, a marker, you like colored some marker on the filter and then you stuck it in water and it separate and the water creeped up it and then it separated into different colors. That's using capillary action. Or if you're using a paper towel or a towel and you're soaking up liquid, that's capillary action. And then capillary tubes. And these have a very, very small diameter end. So they're very small. Okay, they're really, really thin. And sometimes one end is open, sometimes it's closed. Um, but when you put it in the liquid, that open end down, okay, you've got your, and you have your liquid here, the liquid actually is going to travel up into it to a certain height. The height that it goes up into the tube is determined by the surface tension, which is given as a T in the equation, the contact angle between the liquid and the tube. So this is theta and we use degrees. The radius of the tube R, density of the liquid rho, and the acceleration due to gravity G. Okay, so there's the equation here. H equals 2T cosine uh, theta divided by R rho G. Um, when the tube is made of a material to which the liquid molecules are very strongly attracted, they're going to spread out completely on the surface, leading to a contact angle of zero degrees. Cosine of zero is one. So an example of this is water in a glass tube. Okay, so here's some example. Wine wicking up a paper towel. That's a waste of wine um, <laughs> because of the strong attractions of water and ethanol molecules to the cellulose fibers in the towel. And then also the attractions of the water to other water and other ethanol molecules. So when we talk about capillary action this is what, and capillary tubes, this is what we're talking about. Okay, so the liquid can either rise or fall. So it'll rise with something like water, but in mercury it actually falls from the tube. The tube. So let's look at an example. At 25 degrees Celsius, how high will water rise in a glass capillary tube that has an inner diameter of 0.25 uh, millimeters? And we're told the surface tension of water is 71.99 uh, millinewtons per meter, and the density is one gram per cubic centimeter. So 
now we need to remember that our height is equal to 2t times the cosine of theta divided by r rho g. Now we're told water, and so we know from what we just read that for water, theta equals 0 degrees, so the cosine of 0 is equal to 1. Now we also need to have everything in the correct units, meaning we need to use SI units. So we can start with our 25 millimeters, and this is, tells us is the di diameter, and remember we want the radius. So our radius is equal to the diameter divided by 2, so 0 0.25 millimeters divided by 2. And then we also need to go ahead and change this into meters. So there are, but let's say I'm like, crap, I don't remember how many millimeters are in a meter. But I do know that there's one centimeter for every 10 millimeters. And there's one meter for every 100 centimeters. So hey, that worked. Or you can always look up millimeters to meters. That's fine too. But nonetheless, this is 0 0.000. 0, 1, 2, 5 meters. And then let's look at the um, water, ten the, sur the surface tension, T equals 71.99 millinewtons per meter. Millinewtons for one meter. And let's t we need to turn this into regular newtons, so milli. That means there's one newton for every 1,000 millinewtons. Okay, so this is 0 0.07199 newtons. Oh, sorry, newtons per meter. Now, the other thing I want to show you really quick is some units here. So a newton, if you recall, a newton is a kilogram times meter per second squared. Let's do it like that. And this is being divided by a meter. So the meters cancel out and we get kilograms per second squared. Okay, so this is our units for T. And then the next thing, the density of water, we're told 1.0 grams per one cubic centimeter, and we need this in kilograms per cubic meter. We know there's one kilogram per 1,000 grams, and then we have 100 centimeters per one meter, and we need to cube that. So this comes out to be 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And then we know G is 9.8 or 9.81 meters per second. All right, so let's go ahead and plug and chug. So our height is equal to 2 times T, which is 0 0.071. 9, 9, and this becomes kilograms over second squared times the cosine of 0, which we know this is 1. Divide that by our radius, which is 0 0.000125 meters, times our density, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 meters per second. So let's watch our units. We see kilograms cancel. We see, oops, sorry, meters per second squared for G. I can't believe I forgot that. Second squared cancels. We see this meter and this meter take away this cubic, and we're left with just 1 over 1 over meters, which brings that meters to the top. Plug our numbers into our calculator, and we get 0 0.12 meters, 
or 12 centimeters. Pretty big uh, rise in the capillary tube, huh? And then an example of where capillary action um, comes into play is diabetes and blood sugar tests. So um, normally you don't have those big tubes, but um, <laughs> it, they might do that for some tests. But generally, if you're using something like a blood sugar meter, these strips have a little tiny thing on them and it you touch the blood drop to the strip and the blood is drawn into it by capillary action. <laughs> 